It is a great pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Estelle Laser, an independent archaeologist based in Sydney, Australia, where she teaches at the University of Sydney and the University of South Wales. Uh, having her here live in Los Angeles is something we tried to do uh, over many years, uh, given her interests and our own in sites and finds and peoples of the Vesuvian region. That was, of course, delayed by COVID, but we're very pleased that we managed to make our schedules align. Dr. Laser has spent many field seasons working on human skeletal remains at Pompeii, uh, which she had studied for literally decades. They were the subject of her PhD dissertation, and she has continued to work on them collaborating with authorities at the site of Pompeii. She is, in fact, a founding member of the Pompeii Cast Project, whose aim is to better understand the victims of the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in AD 79 by utilizing the latest developments in digital imaging and scientific analysis. Uh, Dr. Laser is the author of dozens of articles, essays, and book chapters. She also regularly appears in documentaries on radio and television. She is the author of this particularly important, although uh, so, you know, somewhat nitty-gritty academic tome, Resurrecting Pompeii, which I recommend to you. She also uh, frequently leads tours and teaches on site in Italy and the Vesuvian region. And this I did not know until I read her CV. She's also a pioneer in the archaeology of Antarctica. And of course, that would be the subject of a very different lecture than the one she's going to give today. Her talk today is entitled, Encased in Plaster, scientific revelations from the cast of Pompeii's victims. And I take a moment now just to let you all know that this presentation does contain scans and images of human remains. Please welcome here to the Getty Villa, Dr. Estelle Laser. Thank you so much for having me here. Uh, it seems like a very appropriate place to be talking about uh, people who lived and died not very far away from the Villa of the Papyri, uh, which, um, of course, the Getty Villa is based on. So it seems really ironic that the event that destroyed so many towns and villas in the Bay of Naples simultaneously preserved them to a degree that has no parallel in the ancient world. And just to remind you, we have every aspect of life preserved. So from very large public spaces and buildings like the Forum in Pompeii and the amphitheatre, which of course is the earliest example of an amphitheatre that we have from the Roman world, uh, we have these which we do find preserved from antiquity and other sites. But where things start to differ is that we have streets and domestic and industrial structures all preserved, not just at foundation level, but sometimes to their full extent. And beyond that, we have the contents preserved. So we have the walls, we have the wall paintings, we have sculptures, we have magnificent works, we have all the graffiti, but we also have the items, as you know, of daily life from um, the most beautiful silverware down to objects of daily life, very humble objects like um, combs, and tweezers, keys, etc. And the reason for this, of course, as you all know, is because we're looking at the archaeology of a mass disaster. So what we have here is a satellite image of uh, the Bay of Naples, just to um, remind you, this is Vesuvius, of course. Um, this is the bay, that's the Sorrentine Peninsula here. This is Capri. We have Ischia Procida. 
And not only do we have Vesuvius, but we've got all these craters and cones, which is the Campi Flagrae, the burning fields. We have, cam uh, we have craters and cones in the bay, and the bay itself is a caldera. So this is actually a supervolcano. So just to remind you of the event that uh, ended life for so many people in the Bay of Naples in 79 CE, um, what we have we think we understand. I mean, the model that's used is the 1980 eruption of uh, Mount St. Helens in Washington State. Uh, what we think happened was that we have a series of explosions. And these, so there's a build-up over time. 17 years before the eruption, there's a big earthquake, which we think starts another round of seismic activity. So as far as we understand, uh, the Vesuvian sites were occupied for at least seven to 800 years before Mount Vesuvius erupted. We don't know a lot about them because the site management strategy was to just dig down to the 79 CE level. And so all the earlier stops underneath, it's just that there's such a remarkable series of sites, we don't want to destroy them. So we only opportunistically dig underneath. But we know that the last big eruption before then was about a thousand years earlier. So it was out of historical memory that this was an active and dangerous volcano. So we have this huge series of um, explosions that result in a big eruption column that has a cloud that's um, sending down ash and pumice in the direction of the wind on that day and the direction southeast. So we have in this image a series of isopacks and um, you can see that the most of them, so there's not much falling on Herculaneum, but most of the ash and pumice is falling on Pompeii. So we get something in the order of two and a half to 2.8 meters, depending on the underlying topography of ash and pumice landing here. Now, this eruption column, it's estimated punched into the stratosphere at its peak at a height of somewhere between 27 and 32 kilometers. And that when the explosion stopped, it couldn't support itself, so it started to collapse. And at this point, you get the super deadly phase of the eruption. So we get a series of hot gas avalanches or pyroclastic density currents um, that come in two forms. So, um, uh, pyroclastic flows, which are dense avalanches of pumice, ash and gas, they tend to hug the ground and a lot of them move towards Herculaneum. And we get pyroclastic surges, which are dilute avalanches that can travel uh, radially in any direction from the crater. And they're super, super deadly. So they can travel at speeds between 100 and 300 kilometres an hour. They can have temperatures anywhere from 100, it's argued as high as 500 degrees Celsius at Herculaneum. They have very little free oxygen, lots of poisonous uh, gases associated with them, and they can lift up um, projectile, uh, objects in their path and turn them into projectiles. So if you haven't left by the time the surges come, you're really not going to survive. So these are just generic images. And I tell you this because um, it explains what the preservation is at different sites. So at Pompeii and the region directly around Pompeii, we have a remarkable form of uh, preservation. So what I have in this image here is a two metre ranging pole. And this is the first phase of the eruption. It's ash and pumice. And we've got, as I said, depending on the underlying ground, anywhere between um, uh, two, uh, two and a half to 2.8 metres. And then we get the pyroclastic flows and surges. So most of them went towards Herculaneum. The first surge killed uh, anyone who hadn't escaped at Herculaneum but didn't reach Pompeii. The second surge didn't reach Pompeii. The third surge reached the walls of Pompeii but um, didn't enter. It's the fourth and fifth surges that came one after the other that we can see in this very thin layer here. And then we have pyroclastic flows, another surge, the sixth surge, and then later material. And it's in this fourth and fifth surge layer that we get the most amazing preservation. And that is very specific to this region. Anything organic in this layer is covered with very fine ash. That's the same chemical composition as cement. It hardened over anything organic, and over time the soft tissue percolated out um, down through that nice porous layer of ash and pumice, leaving a hole, a void. And um, over time, 
you know, that's what we have, a series of holes. When they started officially digging in Pompeii in 1748, they started finding these holes and they didn't quite know what to do with them. Now we get that um, they did start pouring plaster of Paris in, in the 19th century and left it to dry and uh, successfully cast uh, various wooden objects, but didn't successfully cast the first human victim until 1863. And this is the first human victim that was cast. And uh, we have now 106 victims that have been cast to date, and three of those are non-human mammals. There's a dog that was um, the eighth victim to be cast. It was cast in 1874. A pig that was found very near to Pompeii at a working farm at Boscariale in the late 1970s. And just a few years ago in 2018, a stables with um, three horses was found, one of which was able to be cast. But just to remind you, we do get uh, other um, organic remains preserved or their forms being preserved uh, in the ash. So these are a series of folding doors from the Villa of the Mysteries in Pompeii. There's a cart, uh, a cart wheel, and we get a lot of plant material that survives. So we have a very good knowledge of the plant remains. That's a very much, it's the roots of a very mature tree from the south end of Pompeii. Now, just to remind you, Herculaneum is quite different. It experienced a um, much greater number of pyroclastic flows. It ends up being sealed hermetically in somewhere, depending on the underlying ground, uh, something between 17 to 23 metres of um, pyroclastic or volcanic material that sealed the site very effectively. And we don't get the forms of individuals preserved. We get much more actual organic material surviving. Um, often in a carbonised form. So just to remind you, the casts don't happen at Herculaneum, but we do get them from Pompeii. So I started working in Pompeii uh, really a long time ago, in 1986, and the work I did initially was on the victims that weren't cast uh, in plaster, that weren't, uh, we don't have the forms of them, we just have the bones. Now, the bones weren't really well cared for, uh, but they were kept, they didn't throw them away, which is pretty amazing for a site that was excavated from a period before archaeology really became a discipline. And they were stored, for reasons I can't explain to you, in various bath buildings. So this is the Sano Bath Complex. And I started working here. If you can imagine, this is what it looked like three months after I started working. They're just mounds of bones, casts where the arms and legs had come off. Um, that were um, not being displayed to the public. There was a whole ecosystem living in there with the bones. Uh, and uh, I had to make a decision as to what to do with them. They were disarticulated. All the um, skeletons had become separated. So I made a drastic decision to separate these many, many bones into piles. And so we've got piles of left hips, piles of right hips, left legs, right legs, etc. And the reason I did that was so that each bone in each pile represented just one individual. And I could use statistics and modern forensic techniques to try and characterise the population. People had written in the past that it was the old, the infirm, very young people, and for some reason women, who weren't supposed to be fast runners, I guess, um, that became the victims. And this was based on no evidence whatsoever. So I could test this. And what I found is that what we seem to have is a random sample of a normally distributed population of victims. So no skewing uh, towards pathology or age or definitely not sex. Um, if anything, there's slightly more males in the sample than females. But I knew from the first time that I visited Pompeii that the bones were encased within the plaster. So when I saw this victim, I could actually see little toes poking out from the plaster. And I realised that I would have whole skeleton, potentially there'd be whole skeletons inside. And with whole skeletons, um, I could tell so much more. So as, um, doing skeletal identification from individual bones is nowhere near as, um, as desirable as doing it from a whole skeleton. You get much better information. You can tell a lot more. 
if you have more skeletal material. For example, in cases of pathology, um, bone can only respond to insult in a very limited number of ways. You can lose bone, you can gain bone, get new bone deposited, or a combination of the two. And it's looking at patterns of change throughout the skeleton that you can really um, make good diagnoses. In my original work, I was really limited to pathology or disorders that um, could be uh, diagnosed with certainty from just one individual bone. But um, this was not available at that time. The technology just wasn't going to allow me to do that, and the casts are very fragile. Now, the way the casts were achieved was never documented very carefully. And what we believed right up until 2015 is that they were made somewhat like this. The victim died, they were covered with that very, very fine ash and later material, and then when they excavated, they um, would excavate slowly. When they came to a hollow, you could actually hear it and feel it. It's like tapping on the skin of a drum. So a uh, klaxon would be sounded, excavation would stop, they'd introduce two holes. So one for pouring in liquid plaster of Paris and another as an air vent to uh, allow plaster to get into the extremities of the hands and feet. You'd leave that for three or four days and then chip away the ash and you're left with the form of a victim as they were when they died. So just hold that thought. Okay, when they, first, and when they first started making the victims, and you could see the forms of people as they were at the moment of their death, it absolutely captured the public's imagination. And no scientific work was done in the 19th century. People uh, based their interpretations on superficial evidence, so just inspecting the casts, and maybe where they were found and what they were found with. And for example, every individual that had a vaguely distended belly was assumed to be a pregnant woman. So this is the fourth cast, assumed to be a pregnant woman. This is, um, the fourth cast was made in 1863. This is the tenth cast, made in 1875. Uh, you can see the abdomen looks a bit swollen, pregnant woman. This is a, a pair of casts that were made in 1991 interpreted as a husband protecting his, you guessed it, pregnant wife. Okay, now the casts were made by restorers and they restored statues and this is really important to know. They're artists and there's clearly art as well as science in these casts and you can actually date them stylistically just looking at them. So this is the seventh cast. It was made in 1873 and was often described as looking more like a statue than the cast of a victim, often described as a sick person or a sleeping man. And you can see it looks like 19th century sculptures. So it's very naturalistic, quite realistic. Compare that with this cast made in 1961 from uh, the house of Fabius Rufus. Um, it looks a bit more like modern sculpture with rubbery limbs, um, very schematic facial features. Uh, so what? So I knew that there was definitely some improvement made on the cast, but I assumed that they would still contain bones. And we had the first opportunity to test this in 1994 when uh, actual cast came on um, touring exhibition to Australia. Uh, this is a cast that was made in the mid-1980s. It's a one of a kind. So it comes from near Pompeii, from, uh, from a Plontus. There's a villa you can visit in a Plontus that um, is very impressive. It's, uh, there's another a second, so that's called Villa A, uh, allegedly an imperial villa. And behind that, there's a, a working farm. A number of bodies were found there one of which was cast in resin experimentally. And it was really, really difficult to achieve. It was doing, it was, it used a technique, something like the lost wax technique that's used for bronzes. 
and it was so difficult to do, it was never attempted again. And also over time, the resin hasn't weathered very well. It's become very, very fragile, it's starting to fall to pieces and it's lost its translucency. But in 1994, it was in good condition. We applied to the Italian superintendency at the time for permission to do the first ever X-rays and CT scans in Sydney. So it went to um, an X-ray day clinic after the last patient left. It came across Sydney in a specially designed box with um, a seatbelt and um, outriders and entered the ambulance bay as the last um, day patients left. And we subjected it to a full set of X-rays and CT scans up to here. You can see the arms are like this. This is at the effect of heat on protein. It causes it to shrink. So if you meet very high temperatures at or around the depth, so at, of depth, so at minimum 200 to 250 degrees Celsius, you have this contraction occurring and you end up looking a little bit like a boxer, so they call it a pugilistic pose. So um, that prevented it from uh, going into the um, gantry of the CT scanner. So but we were able to get very good x-rays. And what we learned from the x-rays was that this was almost certainly female, so they're the hip bones, and these angles are very wide, consistent with a female attribution. We look at a number of features. Uh, the last bone to develop uh, in an adult is the collarbone at the midline here, and these were fully developed. So we're looking at someone um, at least uh, in the latter part of the third decade. And um, my forensic, I worked with a team, so I had a forensic dentist, radiographer, radiologist, anatomist uh, working with me. And uh, the forensic dentist's uh, radio radiographer was able to put normal dental x-ray plates into the mouth. And what they found was um, that four teeth had tooth decay, so caries, that um, the teeth were worn flat. They had stone ground flour, which tended to cause the teeth to wear flat. Because of their caries, they had some infection that was causing an abscess to form at the apex of one of the roots. And they had some periodontal disease, so there was some loss of bone. Now, actually, looking in the mouth is extremely valuable for archaeologists because we don't have the soft tissue. So the mouth is a very good window on the general health of an individual. I mean, we're one organism, so a healthy mouth, usually healthy body. It's been found that the bacteria associated with caries and particularly with periodontal disease uh, can have a big impact on the general health of a body. So if, um, if there's bacteria which are quite sticky get into the bloodstream, they can attach themselves to heart valves, for example, and cause heart problems. They can cause other cardiovascular problems. They can also be associated with um, things like arthritis, diabetes, um, the bacterium associated with stomach ulcers has also been found um, in the plaque of teeth. So looking in the mouth is really useful first port of call for um, us in our field. Um, we can tell wet from dry bone fractures. So what we're looking at here is um, that's an upper arm bone with a bracelet on it, gold bracelet, and these are the two bones of the forearm. And these fractures here are dry bone fractures that occurred a long time after death. But there was evidence of a healed fracture of the wrist um, consistent with them having fallen on an outstretched hand. And we have um, all the bones of the backbone and the ribs and they're all articulated. So what this told me was it was definitely worth pursuing this line uh, of investigation. I applied for permission to X-ray and CT scan all the casts, and I was given permission, but with a huge number of caveats. Um, I wasn't allowed to lift the casts onto the bed of a CT scanner, so we couldn't CT scan them, and um, we had to do every bit of work on site. So that slowed down the process. And things changed significantly in 2015. In 2015, as part of the Great Pompeii Project to remediate the site, uh, as a UNESCO requirement to keep their World Heritage Statement, Pompeii embarked on a big program um, to um, restore the casts. So 90 of the then 103 casts 
were restored either in situ or in a makeshift laboratory in the so-called House of the Golden Bracelet. So um, they were cleaned, uh, limbs that had broken off were reattached with carbon fibre dowels, they had um, consolidant uh, uh, added to them, there was a lot of work done. And as part of this project, um, I came on board as a consultant to the then superintendency of Pompeii and Herculaneum, because one of the requirements was that work that was being done, um, research that was being done, needed to be disseminated both academically and to the broader um, public. And uh, as part of this, the BBC, coupled with the Smithsonian Channel, Arte, and the then superintendency of Pompeii and Herculaneum, uh, started a, um, put together a documentary on the Great Pompeii Project. And uh, I was asked to do interviews with them. And when I did my interviewer, the producer who's holding the microphone said, we would really like to film you X-raying and CT scanning the casts. I said, that would be wonderful, but we don't have our funding yet. And she said those magic words, can we help you? And suddenly, <laughs> I had my whole team out. And we've actually made three documentaries together. It's been a wonderful um, partnership. Um, so my team, I just want to introduce you to them because I think it's really important to uh, acknowledge that this work is only done as part of a team. Um, every member of the team is really important. So in the top left-hand corner, we have my forensic uh, dentist, Dr. Elaine Middleton, who, um, has done considerable work on um, identifying uh, victims from mass disasters. He worked on the Bali bombing, on identifying victims from the 2004 tsunami, and now he's most appropriately working on the victims of the mass disaster of 79 CE. On the top right is Associate Professor Zung Vu from the University of Notre Dame in Sydney, who's a radiologist and uh, anatomist. On the Bottom left-hand corner is Stain Luke, uh, who's a digital X-ray engineer from uh, Belgium. In the middle, at the bottom, is my co-director, Associate Professor Catherine Welch, who's an ancient historian, and who's tasked with putting our results into a broader Roman context, not just in a Pompeian context, which often Pompeii is sort of seen as its own thing. And on the bottom right are um, the biggest game changers. The men in the blue nitrile gloves are the restorers from the cast restoration project. Suddenly we had permission to um, put, uh, to lift the casts onto the bed of a CT scanner. On the, on the left hand corner of the photograph is Roberto Canalulia, who's uh, an, a, an engineer from Philips, uh, who brought a 16 slice CT scanner onto the site of Pompeii and made this work possible. So just to remind you how a CT scanner works, it's very simple. You have your patient or cast as it transpires on a motorised platform that goes through this opening, the gantry, which has um, a rotating X-ray beam. And as the patient goes through, a series of X-ray slices are made, and these can be stitched together to create an image. So this is a cast going in. These are our slices, if I can get it to work. So this is just the slices, the colours and artefact. So what we're looking at are the slices through the leg bones, and the holes you can see, they are actually the bones of the leg. It's going to join together now at the hips, and you're going to see a flare, two flares, they're reinforcing rods that have been entered in. Then on the right side, you're going to see um, the arm, the right arm, which is flexed, and you'll see three holes, which are the bones of the upper arm and the two forearms, same on the left, the arms flexed, you'll see the three bones. And then we're going to see very soon the lower jaw is going to appear, there it is, then the upper jaw and then we go out through the head. So there are all the slices. Now the magic happens when um, we stitch them together and you get a volume rendered image. And there you can slice and dice your images together, it's a really powerful tool, the colours are an artefact. We can virtually peel the plaster away and reveal the features that are underneath. It's a really powerful tool. 
And we can learn a huge amount from this. And one of the really important things about our project is it's non-invasive and non-destructive. So we're not doing any harm to the cuffs at all, which are really fragile and absolutely unique. So this is a victim uh, that was found at the southern end of the site in the 1930s. And uh, when CT scan, just to give you an idea of what we can learn, um, I'll just see if I can get it to play for you. Um, you can see the bones inside and uh, you can also see, and this is one of the powerful tools here, is that we can isolate individual bones. So I can tell you with a fair degree of certainty that we're looking at an adult male. Now, ideally, we would like to um, CT scan all the casts, but it's not possible. That would be ideal. A number of the casts are still in situ and they're partly embedded in volcanic material or they're in positions that won't allow them to enter a gantry of a CT scanner. So we have to work on them in situ and they have to be x-rayed. Now, x-rays are much more problematic than CT scans. So um, there, there are a lot of problems associated with them. Getting really well-defined images through thick plaster, which is the same density as bone, is very, very problematic. Um, X-rays are essentially shadows. Um, so the X-ray beam passes through an object and you get the shadow on the sensor or the X-ray plate. And uh, what you end out with, um, this is the same victim, is a series of greys. And the more dense an object, the more white it looks. And just, I know it's really hard to interpret this, so let me help you. So, wait a second. So, what we have here, that's a thigh bone or a femur. There's the other one there, oops, up there. We've got a bit of a hip. And here you can see a much denser object, the white thing there. And you go, what on earth is that? Now, angle is everything in x-rays. You have to get the angle right so you don't get distortion. And different angles are going to tell you different things. So while that's pretty hard to interpret at this angle, if I change the angle, you instantly can see that it's a belt buckle. So um, that's what we're working with. And in 2019, we worked on the 13 victims that were found in the so-called Garden of the Fugitives in Pompeii. They were excavated by Mayuri in his last year of tenure in 1961. And they were kept not exactly in situ, but in the same relative positions, very close to where they were found in a glass case. And uh, we were given permission to study these. We actually have a memorandum of agreement with the Pompeii Archaeological Park. So we're working in partnership with them. And it was really difficult to do. It's a very small, tight space. My digital X-ray engineer, um, Stain Luke, came in with his assistant, who's actually an equine vet, Julia Ritter from Holland. And the reason she's an equine vet and a radiographer is because this equipment was initially designed for veterinary purposes. So animals that don't happily go into an, a veterinary clinic like giraffes and rhinoceroses and, and horses. And um, they worked together brilliantly. They were crumpled in the most uncomfortable position for very long periods. And Julia had to hold that sense of very, very um, still to get good x-ray images. They work very very well together, very fast, because if you're dealing with horses and x-ray equipment, you have to move fast, or you and your equipment could be badly damaged. <laughs> Us, on the other hand, we were outside, <laughs> in the comfortable outdoors, looking at the screen so that we could ask for different angles as we um, did our work. You can see we're being documented as we go. Um, that's part of the deal of a lot of the work we've done. But it's good because it means that the results of our work get shared with very wide public very quickly. So I think, I mean, we have no editorial control about what goes into the documentary, but at least there's dissemination of our knowledge. <clears throat> so just to give you a few quick results. So this um, victim here, you might have seen before, seems to be resting on one arm. This person we x-rayed, and what we found inside the head was a very large hook, which you can ask me about later. But what we found skeletally was that um, the teeth... Uh, well, there are a few features that are quite useful. 
So here we have, this is the frontal sinus, which only really develops in adulthood. So definitely looking at an adult. The teeth are all fully developed. They develop from the crown to the root. They're fully developed and there's a lot of wear on the teeth, which, um, as I said, they had stone ground flour. And um, that suggests that there were um, probably an older individual. And we have another piece of evidence that uh, confirms this. We're looking here at the left wrist, and I know you might need the eye of faith for this, but there's the hand, and these are the bones of the wrist, and the joint space is very, very greatly reduced, and there's changes to the bone, all of which are consistent with um, long, um, long-held arthritis, so quite advanced, long-standing arthritis on the hand of this individual. Uh, this individual here uh, is a young adult, and the teeth were all displaced, but it told us that we're looking at a, a young person in their late teens, a consistent with someone in their late teens and early, or early 20s. And what I wanted to show you here is they're the feet. So you can see on one foot, there's this strange series of um, objects. And what they are is hobnails. They were used um, to attach the lower to the upper part of sandals, but they also worked as hobnails to give a little traction on the ground. And what I like about this image is it really brings out the human experience of a mass disaster. So at this point, they're trying to escape. They're walking across this very loose ash and pumice stone. It's really uncomfortable. They've lost a sandal. They're trying to escape. They just keep walking. So I think it's quite a poignant image. Um, we have quite a lot of cases of um, individuals with sandals. This is a victim that was found uh, in the so-called House of the Cryptoporticus, uh, cast in, 2000, uh, in 1914, sorry. And you can see on the foot there's the remains, um, the impression of the sandal, they're the straps you can see. And when we x-rayed um, each foot, we found again those wonderful hobnails. So both feet had the sandals on. Now, the cast proved to be much more complicated than we initially anticipated. So when we uh, put the cast of the dog, which, as I told you, was the eighth victim cast in 1874, everyone knows the dog. It was found in the so-called House of Bessonius Primus or the House of Orpheus in Pompeii. Um, it's something that people can really relate to, this dog that was chained. There are two bronze rings on the uh, form of the collar. Um, chained to the atrium of the house. We put it into the CT scanner, and to our surprise, what we found inside was no bones. This dog had no bones, but lots of metal. We have the two bronze rings of the collar, um, and this is where the head had come off and had been reattached, and lots of reinforcing material. This is not what we expected the documentation told us. So what are we looking at? If we look at the volume rendered exterior, what we see, the different colours tell us their different uh, densities of plaster. What we, have, uh, um, uh, what we have presented here is evidence that this dog was made in about six to seven pieces. So maybe a limb had come off and they reattached something, but absolutely not what we expected. We expanded our project to not just looking at the bones inside the casts, but actually the casts themselves. How were they achieved? What do they tell us about 19th century um, restoration techniques and archaeology? We put the pig into the CT scanner and it had lots of bones. Um, but when we put the head in, again, I'm sorry, the colours and back to the Phillips program, there is no skull. It's totally sculpted. So what were the restorers and archaeologists doing in the 20th century? So we're now looking at the history and philosophy of restoration. Uh, so just to give you a few more cases, in the 1970s, when they excavated the so-called House of the Golden Bracelet in the western edge of Pompeii, they found four victims under a staircase looking like they were heading towards the port. Uh, there was a very small child and uh, an adult with the child seemingly sitting on their lap. 
and uh, another adult. The two, the, only the child could be put into the gantry of a CT scanner. So I just wanted to show you the child. So this is, um, this, one. this is the volume rendered exterior. You can see the clothing that they were wearing, the impression of the clothing. And we still get the imprint of the weave of clothing. And this is the inside, which has quite a lot of skeletal material. And what we found inside was um, at the chest there was a buckle. So obviously they'd, um, they had a belt on and it had sort of, when, the, when they fell with the surge, the clothes had sort of crumpled upwards. If we look through the um, skull, we're looking at a series of slices going through the skull. So what we can see here, that's uh, the eye sockets. Oh, wait a second, you can't see that. Give me a second if I can get this closer. So we've got the eye sockets, the opening for the nose. These are the primary teeth or the milk teeth. Uh, and these are going to be the adult teeth. So that they're forming very high up in the jaw, forming from the crown to the root. And looking at the, um, the, the development of the teeth, which teeth have erupted and the degree of development, we can get a good estimate of the age of death of an individual. Um, there's a bit of variation between populations, uh, between boys and girls, uh, girls develop faster, and also individuals, there's a range. But, so we can't get an exact age um, because there's variation between individuals. But if we look through the slices, what we can see is this individual has an overbite. We can also see um, the lower jaw appearing and you can see, again, only the primary teeth or the milk teeth or the baby teeth uh, are erupted and the adult dentition, the permanent dentition, is still developing in the jaw. So my uh, forensic dentist, who has many, many years of experience, thought the age would be somewhere between two and a half and three year and a half years of age when they died. And he thought probably closer to the three-year age range. And the other skeletal evidence confirms this. So what we're looking at is a slice through the um, leg, the, that's the hip bones, that's the upper, um, the thigh bone or the femur, the shin bone, the, um, the tibia and the fibula. And these little bones, here, that's the heel, these little bones of the foot originally forming cartilage and they don't ossify, they don't become bone till about three years of age. So his assessment's fairly correct. I just want to show you a, a few more examples, a few more case studies, to give you a sense of how complex um, the issues are that we're dealing with. What we're looking at here is an image of the ninth and 10th victims that were cast in 1875. They were found at the northern end of the site. In the foreground, we've got the ninth victim uh, that was, uh, for some reason, um, described as being, well, male and um, for, uh, North African, not based on any evidence that we're aware of. And in the background, the 10th victim, the so-called pregnant woman. So I'll start with the ninth victim. Uh, so we uh, um, were actually given permission to take him to the local hospital in Pompeii in 2017. Uh, and what we found is um, the elbows are sticking out so we couldn't get all of it into the gantry of the CT scanner. We had to CT scan it in two swipes, sort of um, head and then legs, and there's a gap where we couldn't um, a CT scan at all. And every single bone told us that we're looking at a very young individual, um, consistent in age with someone between 14 and 17 years of age, probably closer to um, someone in modern Western population of like 14 or 15 years of age. The bones of the skull aren't fully developed. The wisdom tooth, the third molar, is still unerupted in the jaw. Um, all the bones are still developing. And we have also the hip bones. And generally, sub-adults aren't very easy to establish sex on, but I feel very um, confident that we're looking at a male here. This angle here is extremely narrow. Um, so this is um, the part, this is below the pubic area. Um, it's where if a baby was born naturally, that's where the head would come through and there's no way that any head would get through that space of a baby. Um, so there are various other features that tell us I'm pretty certain it's a male. 
uh, as I said, there was a gap that we couldn't uh, CT scan, so we x-rayed it. And to our amazement, on the little finger of the left hand, we found a ring. And uh, it's corroded, so it's probably made of iron and would have had a stone set in it. But where the setting is, it looks very um, clean and uncorroded. Could be gold, but they didn't usually use gold for settings. This is a ring that was um, found in Herculaneum, an iron ring with a, with a semi-precious stone uh, set into it, with the sun god on it. Um, that's probably what it would have looked like. We're not taking it out of the plaster, it's staying there. So the tenth victim, uh, again cast in 1875, described as a pregnant woman. And this victim was often eroticised and often compared to a, a statue. It's a Roman copy of a Hellenistic statue from the second century BCE. Um, known as the Aphrodite Callipigus, the Venus with the beautiful buttocks, which she's admiring here. And um, even in drawings, it was made very, very voluptuous. So um, uh, this is an illustration from the early 20th century. She has sort of Kardashian sort of um, <laughs> dimensions. Uh, in my own drawing, she's not quite so curvaceous. Um, and... When we put this individual into the um, gantry of the CT scanner, what we found to our surprise was, um, sorry, just having cursor issues. Um, inside we found initially no evidence of bones at all. Now I was really interested in this because um, in the, um, unfortunately, in 1943, uh, Pompeii became collateral damage of World War II. The Canadian, uh, American and British allies were trying to stop the Germans from advancing up the coast and they bombed the region heavily. They couldn't control where the bombs landed and somewhere between 150 and 160 bombs landed in Pompeii and they destroyed the antiquarium where a lot of the casts were kept and they always made copies of the casts and I wondered if this weren't a copy of, the, of a cast, so not an original. Another reason I wondered about that, apart from not seeing bones, is that um, this, uh, this hand that the victim's resting on doesn't look the same as all the photos that I've seen in archival images. Anyway, we put it through the CT scanner. My radiologist, um, uh, Zung Vu, luckily has obsessive compulsive disorder and looked at every single slice, which is great. So what I'm going to show you now is the bed of the CT scanner. And what we can see on the left is the elbow, on the right will be the hand. Okay, so we go through slice by slice. And what we start to find is something really amazing, the bones of the forearm. So this is the ulna that attaches to the elbow. As we keep going, you can see the radius. This is not a cast of a cast, it's the original. You can see here the plaster is a different colour to the plaster of the hand. It's a different density, there's a line. This is the original cast and they've lost the hand and someone's made a new one and reattached it with a dowel that's going to uh, present as a flare right here. And this is quite amazing. So what were they doing here? We've got two casts made at exactly the same time and one's full of bones and the other has just two. It's um, a bit of a mystery. If we look at the volume rendered exterior, what we find doesn't look particularly female. I think that distended ab abdomen is again the clothing that bunched up as they fell when the surge hit them. And obviously how they were making the casts isn't the way that um, was described in the very scant literature. This is a cast that was made in 2002 by a Japanese team. And what they did is before they poured the plaster in, they opened out the hole a lot and took out as many bones as they could to study in laboratory and then just poured the plaster in. And you can see about a quarter of the cast is missing. And so what I think they were doing in the past was opening out the... Um, uh, about the area into the voids much, much more than we ever knew from the literature, adding a lot of reinforcing and sometimes other material. Um, uh, 
designing what was lost. Now, this is really important for us to try and tease out what's original and what isn't because interpreting the cast depends on us understanding what's original and what isn't. And of course, these casts are iconic, so we really do want to know what's original material. Um, to understand what we're looking at, of course, we need to know how these casts were made. So, for example, I mentioned the pugilistic pose before where the effect of heat on protein causes um, shrinkage and flexion of the limbs, uh, as in this case. Uh, so, you know, we need to know that that's original for this. Also, um, this case from the Garden of the Fugitives, where we have something that's um, not well understood by the medical profession. The person looks like they were at the moment of their death. Um, they look like they're resting on one arm. And this is described as cadaveric spasm. And it, uh, it results usually in cases of very sudden or violent deaths. And all the muscles go into spasm at the time of death. And they stay in that place until the end of rigor mortis, 18 to 36 hours after death. The muscles will relax again. But because um, they're encased in this plaster that's hardened around them, we get people actually preserved as they were at the moment of their death. I have just a few minutes uh, of time left. Can I give you one more example? Is that okay? Are you all right with that? Okay, I just want to give you a sense of what our project's about. We met this person earlier. They were found at the southern end of the site um, by Mayuri in the 1930s. And uh, they were um, described by Mayuri, they're actually found outside a latrine, an ancient latrine, uh, at the southern end of the large palaestral gymnasium. And uh, Mayuri describes this individual as a muleteer, because a mule was found nearby. A number of victims were found in the latrine. And what Mayuri wrote was that, um, that they thought that they were still restoring the um, palaestra after 17 years of... Um, uh, the, after the earthquake and uh, 62 uh, CE, and that when the eruption started, there was a lot of seismic activity, and that the majority of the workers fled to this latrine for safety and locked the door. Um, this person was running a bit late and pounded on the door, but no one answered. And so Mayuri wrote that this person curled themselves up into their blanket like a caterpillar, I'm using his words, like a caterpillar in its cocoon and resigned himself to death. That was Mayuri's description of this individual. Um, in 2014, uh, Paul W.S. Anderson um, made a really forgettable film called <laughs> Pompeii in 3D. And he based his characters on the casts. So like all these films, they have to have an evil villain. And our evil villain's played by Kiefer Sutherland. He's um, a senator called Corvus. He has no redeeming features. He's a bully. And Paul W.S. Anderson assumed that, like all bullies, he must be a coward. And, um, and based this character on this victim, which he called the cowering man. Now, this is wrong on so many levels, but this victim wasn't found looking like this. They were found looking like this. Um, and what happened was in 1947, after World War II, in that little inset picture, a restorer restored the cast, adding plaster to the base so it would sit up because it was easier to display. Um, so when we studied this individual, I told you earlier it was an adult male, you can see the, um, the, the bones inside, and we've got the backbone, the hips, the legs. The hands and the, and the arms aren't there. They're sculpted. <laughs> they don't exist. When we looked at um, the, um, the slices, what we can see is the stratigraphy of the... Um, of the construction of the cast. So it's a really valuable tool. We can start to reconstruct how these casts are made. So what we've got are the layers that were laid down. You can see a bit of the hip bone there and leg. Um, how they're laid down over time and how the cast was constructed. We can see where the restorer added plaster later on. We can see where bits have been patched on. And you can notice the stratigraphy of the heads perpendicular to the rest of the body. 
and that was cast separately upside down and then um, a hole was drilled in and it was attached with a rod. So we're starting to be able to reconstruct the lives of these individuals, which I think is really important. So the aims of our project are to build on the work I started way back last century to learn about the victims of the eruption, to get them to tell their own story, not the stories that have been superimposed onto them by um, scholars uh, and other storytellers. I'm really happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh, while the microphones are making their way to you, um, I'll begin with one of the questions from Zoom, but first I'll just like to observe that several of you here might have seen some of these cats, such as the mule tear and the so-called pregnant women, woman here in our exhibition, The Last Days of Pompeii in 2012. And those casts that came were modern after casts of the original casts. So they were hollow, they had no human remains inside, but it's just fascinating to me to learn how much the so-called original casts maybe aren't original, but have been reworked. So um, the first question on Zoom is actually a couple of questions, uh, and I'll just read them. Uh, is there an estimated death toll in total from Pompeii? And um, the, um, the questioner, Tracy Drum, says, I heard some years ago that most inhabitants had already evacuated, but more info that that's not the case and asking about prominent citizens dying at Pompeii, and there must have been many years of commemoration and mourning. So Estelle, if you're able to comment on those points. Okay, um, and they're great questions. And one of the problems with archeology span is you can ask any question you like, but you don't necessarily get an answer. Uh, so we would love to know exactly how many people died. We'd love to know what the size of the population was at Pompeii, but we don't have a census. Uh, the um, estimate that was made initially, and it was made on the basis of how many victims were found within certain areas. So there was an estimate made, um, I think it was by Fiorelli in the 19th century, of uh, 2,000 victims. And that number stayed as almost a magic number. But uh, we, um, we haven't found 2,000 victims. And really, unfortunately, uh, it's very important to understand that archaeology didn't exist as a discipline in the 18th century. So the first 100 years of excavation weren't marked by as much documentation as we would have liked. And certainly the human victims weren't the key interest of scholars working in Pompeii. So often in the excavation diaries, you'll find more of the unfortunates found today, but no number. In um, uh, about a bit over 20 years ago, um, De Carolus and Patrick Shelley did oh, like a gigantuan task. They actually went through all the excavation diaries and counted the number of victims. And uh, they, they worked out um, that there were over a thousand they could account for, over 1,100 if those days where they said they're more, they averaged two at least. So at least 1,100 victims, that's the best we have so far. Great, thank you. Well, not so great, but <laughs> um, I would point out also that Professor Stephen Tuck of Miami University, who lectured here, I don't remember how long ago, has been studying the refugees from Pompeii, the survivors, known not only from ancient literature, we know that the Emperor Titus sent aid to the area, but by looking at inscriptions and names, he's been studying the resettlement patterns of people who, who did survive. So while we're very familiar with the victims from the cast and the narratives, true and false, that have been woven around them, there are also many narratives of survivors. Yep, so that's it's true. We, we have, yeah, it's always important to remember that it was possible to escape and a number of people did escape. I was wondering if there was any way to enter the cast or the skeletons to take the DNA samples and relate them back to maybe some people of today if there were relatives. Yeah, so our project um, 
is very specific about being non-invasive and non-destructive. There have been some DNA samples taken uh, during the cast restoration project. They're being studied by Professor Caramelli at um, Florence. And, um, and they, they, I mean, the techniques have improved for ancient DNA immensely in recent years. And they certainly are getting results. Yeah, they found um, a number of individuals not related, related, yeah, so we're learning a bit about the DNA. And there's work being done on the skeletal remains that aren't in casts as well. Thank you for speaking to us today. Um, have recent archaeological work by you and others at Pompeii caused you to modify your 2009 tentative suggestion that many, if not most, of the residents of the walled city escaped eruption? And I'm referring to in resurrecting Pompeii, you you and you characterize it as a suggestion. Yeah, that, we. That we that many or if not most of the people inside the walled city escaped? I think a number of people did escape. We have evidence for that. Uh, the actual numbers we can't know and we don't know how many people might have perished in the countryside while escaping, but certainly some escaped. So I still have the suggestion rather than any definite answer. Uh, from Zoom, we have a question from Nora Goldschlager. Were you able to detect systemic disease, tumors, et cetera, by CT and X-ray in any of the population? Uh, we found one disorder, which I actually found just by visual inspection, uh, inside the frontal bone of the skull, which is a, um, an endocrine disorder. That's not of great clinical significance, but it's um, usually found in older, usually postmenopausal women. And the frequency was consistent to what we'd expect to find in a modern Western population, which um, was very interesting for two reasons. One, it um, confirms that we're looking at a random sample of a normally distributed population of victims, I stress victims, and two, that the women weren't all dying in childbirth, which a lot of my um, colleagues tend to um, kill off our ancestors at earlier ages, and that's easy to do because establishing age at death from a skeleton, of an adult skeleton, is quite challenging. Um, that you have to reach a certain age to get these disorders, so age-related disorders are very, very telling about the ancient world. A, a similar question uh, also on Zoom. Uh, were actually any pregnant females found or was this just the <laughs> fantasy? Uh, um, they have found um, in Herculaneum and in Pompeii, not in the cast so far, but in, uh, in the skeletal sample that's been found, that's been excavated, a couple of cases have been found. Not in the casts yet. A uh, question here in the back. Uh, I, w I wanted to know, uh, how, how did they not have any, how is it that some didn't have any bones? Ah, uh, yeah, well, that's a fantastic question, which we'd love to know, too. Obviously, when they were making the casts, they were manipulating a lot more than we expected. They weren't just pouring plaster of Paris in. They were um, opening the cusps out and taking bones out and sometimes introducing other material into that space. So, yeah, they turn out to be much more complicated than we ever imagined. Thank you very much. That was fascinating. Uh, how can we find the documentary so we can watch it too? The documentaries? That, that, that we're, was being filmed? Um, the BBC. Oh, oh, the BBC one. Um, there, there are several documentaries. Uh, so there was one made in 2015, which um, I should remember the titles, but um, they all start with Pompeii and have a colon. And then there's something <laughs> truly awful like the people frozen in time. Or um, uh, I, they had different names depending who, who was airing them, but there was the Smithsonian Channel. There was one done with Mary Beard. And there was one in 2017, uh, which had 
Matt Hughes, uh, and then a third one that was made in 2019, which is National Geographic. I hope that's helpful. We'll have I'll, to look I'll, for your IMDb I'll, page. I'll, um, <laughs> I'll, I'll get the names for you and I'll, I'll make sure they get posted. Um, question from Zoom asks you, uh, taking the hook you left in your lecture, could you please explain the metal hook inside of that one? Uh, Absolutely, skull? yeah. So this individual's head was actually cast separately from the body and it was cast upside down. And one of the wonderful things about working with um, um, Elaine Middleton, who's a forensic dentist, but he's also a clinical dentist, he's got huge knowledge of plaster that's turned out to be absolutely invaluable for this project. Um, it was cast upside down, there's an air pocket there. So they poured the plaster in and that's the air pocket that was left. And then this, this hook that you can see it's curved here and I'll show you another image. Um, it's actually attached, it's curved at the other end and that's so that it, it won't rotate. And then it's attached to a plug to the rest of the body. And so that's how this cast is actually being constructed. And without doubt, the facial features have been um, sculpted in. On behalf of all of the audience to thank Dr. Laser for a wonderful presentation. Thank you so very much.